You know, it really hasn't been such a very long time since motoring and discomfort were pretty much inseparable. The motorist and any passengers hardy enough to come along were routinely exposed to loud engine noise, treacherous road conditions, and the elements, not to mention the dirt and mud. As automotive design evolved, engineers learned more and better ways to isolate a car's occupants from exterior noise and vibration, and, of course, from the weather. When the current body style Park Avenue was introduced in 1991, it was a perfect example of just how far automotive design has progressed. The redesigned car quickly gained a reputation as one of the smoothest and quietest riding sedans on the American road. Ironically, it was because the cars were so quiet that some drivers became aware of noises that would most likely have gone unnoticed in the past. A driver may, for example, complain of wind noise that he hears when driving at highway speed. Wind noise is most frequently the result of very small irregularities in the fit of the seals and molding strips around the glass areas of the vehicle. For instance, there may be a small gap at the windshield upper reveal molding, a gap just big enough to allow a playing card to fit between the molding seal and the surface of the roof or glass, can cause a very noticeable whooshing noise, also referred to as wind rush. The reveal molding is designed so that, when properly installed, its seals provide smoothly contoured surfaces that allow a clean flow of air over the area where the surfaces of the windshield and the roof come together. Any gapping at the molding seals can disturb the smooth flow of air over the joint between the windshield and the roof. The resulting turbulence increases with vehicle speed, and so does the noise level produced by the turbulence. Hi, I'm Chuck McLennan. Welcome to our Know-How Wind Noise Repair Update. As you may recall in our previous wind noise diagnosis and repair program, we showed you how to repair the most commonly reported wind noise conditions, including the windshield reveal molding gapping condition we just mentioned. Since that program was released, engineers from the General Motors Noise and Vibration Laboratories have continued to perform extensive wind tunnel and road testing on current style Park Avenue and LeSabre models. Their goal is to refine these world-class vehicles so they have an interior noise level that provides the ultimate customer satisfaction. In this program, we'll show you a package of materials the engineers developed to reduce wind noise levels on Park Avenue and LeSabre models. The package has been used on production cars built after May of 1993. We'll also look at some trim adjustment techniques that apply to all Park Avenue and LeSabre models with a wind noise condition around the door glass perimeter. Keep in mind that installing the wind noise reduction package is certainly not a quick fix. The procedure takes considerable time and may not cure all wind noise problems. So before installing the wind noise reduction package, a careful diagnosis must be performed to evaluate the true source of the noise described by the customer. In other words, the first step in repairing any wind noise situation is to verify the exact nature of the customer complaint. With this in mind, let's quickly review the key steps you should follow when a customer comes into your dealership with what appears to be a wind noise concern. The initial step is to verify the customer's complaint. This is best done by taking a road test, preferably with the customer present. A customer concern sheet, like the one in the know-how reference manual, should also be completed at this time. When a noise condition has been confirmed, the next job is to pinpoint as closely as possible the location of the noise. A test drive with an assistant driving the car at highway speed will allow you to use a stethoscope to narrow down the wind noise source. The specific noises we're concerned with in this program are those that occur around the perimeter of the front and rear door glass and also along the door belt line. When the source of the noise is determined to be in these areas, perform a careful visual inspection of the exterior trim molding and seals in the location of the noise. 
You can often visually identify the source of wind noises if you know what to look for. Let's start with the door outer belt seal. The entire lip of the door outer belt seal must be fully compressed against the door surface. Check along the seal to ensure there are no gaps or folds. Gaps or folds can cause excessive wind noise along the door inner belt line, and especially at each end, and next to the division posts. Check the position of the inner belt strip on the front door. The edge of the sealing lip at the division post notch should touch the rear edge of the molded triangle on the glass run channel. Check that there is full contact of the glass run channel outer sealing lip to the door window glass. Also, the run channel should come fully over the window glass so that this outer sealing lip contacts the glass surface properly. This is what body engineers call a full wink over. Check that there are no gaps between the windshield side reveal molding sealing lip and the glass surface. Also, check that there is no gapping between the glass and the run channel sealing lip along the rear of the front door at the applique. There should be full contact along the entire length of the glass run channel auxiliary sealing lip, particularly down the windshield pillar. Also, check along the sail panel where the wind runs across the sealing lip. The most crucial area, though, is at the roof and windshield corners, where the windshield side reveal molding and the drip rail come together. Engineers call this Spock's ear. Next, we'll look at the door-to-body primary seals. Check that the seals are properly positioned and fully seated in the door opening. Check especially for a good fit in the upper corners. Of course, all of these checks I've made also apply to the rear door. However, when inspecting the rear, you should check for full contact of the drip rail closeout seal here along the sail panel. If you find any of the gapping or poor fit conditions I've just described, the first thing to do is to verify that the condition is in fact the true source of the customer's noise complaint. For instance, if I found gapping here between the windshield and the reveal molding, I would cover the area where I see gapping, then go drive the car to see if the tape makes a difference. Be sure to use masking tape because duct tape will damage newer paint finishes. If the customer's noise complaint is substantially reduced by masking over the area, then you've found the cause of the problem and you can proceed with the appropriate repair. For specific repair procedures, you may wish to refer to our previous wind noise program, Buick Know How 158 for the most common wind noise repairs. As I mentioned earlier, the kit is installed in the assembly plant on Park Avenue, Ultra, or LeSabre models built after May of 93. So, if you have a noise condition around the front or rear door glass on a 1991 or 92 car, and your visual inspection reveals none of the conditions I just discussed, then it's time to install the wind noise package. On cars built after May of 1993, you might check to ensure the insulation package is properly installed. Now let's take a look at the pieces supplied with the noise reduction kit. These insulators are specially shaped 25 millimeter thick urethane foam pieces that are treated to repel water. The front insulator's principal purpose is to reduce noise, which is heard along the leading edge and base of the front door fixed glass. The rear insulator seals the lower rear corner of the rear door fixed glass. The insulators also fill the sheet metal notch at the end of the door and prevent the transmission of noise through the hollow paths in the garnish molding. The front door insulator is installed at the extreme front of the door resting on the strap between the inner and outer door panels at the base of the fixed glass. The insulator has a notch that fits over the front edge of the door. On some cars, there may be a small foam patch already installed in this location. This patch is removed before installing the new insulator. The upper portion of the insulator is shaped to wrap around the base of the A-pillar inside the garnish molding. The rear insulator has a nose that fits into a notch on the rear door end panel. The upper portion wraps around the C-pillar inside the garnish molding. This B-pillar patch was designed to seal the upper corner of the glass run channel to the door frame 
and prevent air leaks and the accompanying noise. The patch is installed so that it covers the notch in the upper corner of the B-pillar. The B-pillar patch provides a continuous seal to the glass run channel. The patch works in conjunction with the L-foam, which is applied to the glass run channel at the assembly plant. This L-foam patch was not used on cars built before May 93. I'll show you how to make one a little later. Now I'll show you the kit installation procedure. Before removing the exterior belt strip, it's a good idea to apply a length of masking tape to protect the paint surface from scratches. Remove the belt strip. Remove the interior division post garnish. Then carefully remove the glass run channel. If the glass run channel is to be reused, inspect the retaining clips for damage. It may sometimes be necessary to replace the two-sided tape in the run channel. This should be done if the tape is damaged during removal or if it will not adhere properly to the door. Remove the B-pillar applique and two garnish moldings. Remove the existing square or L-shaped patch from the top corner of the B-pillar. Install the new B-pillar patch from the kit like this. At this point, inspect the remaining patches for proper coverage of holes and potential noise sources. If any holes or gaps are not covered, seal them with a similar patching material from the kit. Current production cars have a foam patch here on the inner surface of the molded triangle at the bottom of the division post on the front door glass run channel. On cars without this patch, you can fabricate one using the foam supplied with the kit or with 3M exterior weather strip. As I mentioned earlier, current production cars also have an L-shaped foam patch at the top of the B-pillar leg of the glass run channel. Cut two strips of 3M exterior door foam 80 millimeters long to form an L. 1991 and early 1992 vehicles have a molded end at the bottom of the A-pillar leg of the front glass run channel. On later vehicles, the channel is simply cut off at the bottom, like this. When adjusting a vehicle with the open channel, use RTV or similar sealing material to close the end of the channel and fill any gap to the foam rubber seal. Remove the rectangular patches or rubber bumpers from the back of the B-pillar applique. Some patches may adhere to the door frame when the applique is removed. Replace the smaller patches with a strip of 3M foam along the entire length of the angled surface adjacent to the mounting surface on the back of the applique. Before installing the front door insulator, remove the small foam patch if present. Insert the insulator between the inner and outer door panels resting on the sheet metal strap. Hook the front of the insulator over the front of the door. Install the A-pillar garnish molding over the foam by gently spreading the lower end and sliding the garnish over the insulator. Ensure that the foam wraps around the pillar inside the garnish. Install the remaining garnish molding in applique.
Align the front and rear appliques. Reposition the T-foam patch at the top of the division post if it was removed. Then, install the glass run channel using care not to damage the foam patches. Don't stick down the run channel double-sided tape yet. At this point, you should ensure that the inner belt strip on the front door is positioned so that the edge of the sealing lip at the division post notch touches the rear edge of the molded triangle on the glass run channel. If there is a gap, try to slide the belt strip forward as much as possible to close it. It may be necessary to remove the door trim panel and reposition the belt strip so there is no gap. Before sticking the run channel double-edged tape into final position, run the window up to ensure it operates properly. Also, check that there is adequate penetration of the window glass into the seals around the entire perimeter. As we saw earlier, there must be a full wink over of the channel seal against the glass. It may sometimes be necessary to remove the trim panel and adjust the glass to achieve a good seal around the perimeter. For example, if noise was observed from the rear door glass along the upper portion of the B-pillar and along the top edge near the division post, it's beneficial to tilt the glass forward slightly. This can be done by loosening the rear window sash mounting nut and shifting the rear sash support stud to the top of the mounting hole in the door. If the glass needs to be tilted further for a proper fit, that is, more than the rear stud mounting hole allows, it is necessary to remove the window sash and file the bottom of the front stud mounting hole. The rear door insulator is installed in the same manner as the front insulator, except the foam does not hook over the edge of the door. Instead, the nose piece of the rear insulator rests in a notch in the door panel. I hope seeing the noise reduction kit installation in detail will be very useful to a lot of our know-how viewers. The procedures we've covered here are also described in a recent GM service bulletin number 201008. One of the people who put this bulletin together is Frank Justice from Buick Service in Flint. Frank, welcome to Buick Know How. Thank you, Chuck. It's nice to be here. Frank is here to tell us about the door handle whistling condition described in the bulletin. Let's do it. Great. The door handle whistling condition is caused by this gap between the door handle casting and the plastic portion of the handle. It can be repaired quickly using RTV or a similar sealing compound to fill the gap. Use a thin nozzle and be careful not to get any RTV on the painted surfaces. And that's all there is to it, Chuck. Boy, you sure made it look easy. Thanks, Frank. It's been great having you here. It's my pleasure. Thank you. Before we finish, I'd like to mention a wind pulsing or buffeting condition that's been described a number of times to the folks at Buick Technical Assistance Center. This condition occurs when Park Avenue or LeSabre models are driven at highway speed with the rear windows rolled down slightly. As you know, Buick design engineers put a great deal of effort into making this car very aerodynamic primarily to reduce drag and increase fuel efficiency. When air flows over the smooth lines of the car, it attaches itself physically to the surfaces. When windows are open, outside airflow becomes unattached and compresses the air inside the car. The compressed air acts as a spring and pushes the incoming air back out. Under certain conditions, an annoying rhythm can develop due to the changing pressure on the driver's inner ear. This condition is the normal result of airflow around the body of the car. No repairs are required. However, a customer with this complaint should be advised that opening a front window just slightly will eliminate the annoying buffeting sensation. It may also be helpful to explain that driving at highway speeds with the rear windows open significantly reduces the car's fuel efficiency. Well, I hope you'll find the information in this program helpful in resolving difficult wind noise complaints. And remember, always thoroughly diagnose any car with a wind noise complaint before installing the noise reduction kit. You could save yourself a lot of valuable time.
I'll see you in the next know-how.